Hi guys, uh, I've decided that I'm going to, going to just record this lesson for you and post the video and you can watch it whenever you have time. Between now and Friday would be a good idea. Uh, I will be covering here in class with um, our in-class students this on Thursday afternoon. So I think this might be the pace that we set. Uh, the in-class lecture will be all together. There'll be conversation times as well. We'll do some conversation and debate and different activities together as a class on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But that for uh, the Tuesday, Thursday, when you don't have to be synchronous online in the morning with me, that I will just record whatever lesson I cover in the afternoons on Tuesday, Thursday, and I will post them. So I hope that works for you. Um, if this is a problem or if there's uh, an issue with the videos or anything, please let me know. Uh, we're all trying to figure this whole new system out and hopefully this is the best way to do this. So yesterday um, we started off with this idea of looking at uh, environmental issues from a Christian perspective. And I had you guys uh, take a look at Robert Frost's poem and then kind of analyze this idea of the roads, the two roads that we have that are divergent that we get to pick uh, from in our lives. And so we have the road that is wide and easier and is popular and that we see that the world in general is, is taking and journeying on together uh, in this broad concept of communal living and social living. But then there's this narrow road, this harder road, this windy road uh, that seems to be something that's not as popular or is a little more difficult to live, but that that road could lead to a longer, more sustainable journey. Um, and so we can use that to talk about our Christian faith or about choices or about sin and temptation. Uh, in this particular context, I'm asking you to compare it to environmental issues. Uh, is our larger social, sorry, my video is being interrupted by an announcement in class. Um, the, um, the larger social pressure to do what is easy and fast, fast food, fast cars, um, our plastic world, um, is that leading us toward a future that is good or is it leading us towards a future that uh, might not be sustainable and lead to destructive things for our world and for humanity. So it's a, it's a bigger ethical conversation to have when we look at the environment. So we are going to come at this um, from uh, different types of ethical viewpoints. And there's going to be three different ethical viewpoints that I present to you. We're gonna start off looking from what is considered a westernized Christian anthropomorphic um, perspective, but I'm also going to be presenting to you in a later lesson, the biocentric and the envirocentric perceptions of, of taking care of the environment as well. So we'll start off with this more traditional westernized Christian um, perspective, which puts human beings at the center of our universe, puts it at the center of that creation story that God created the heavens and the earth and he filled it with life and that everything was in perfect balance, that there was this perfect garden and that he created man and woman in his image and that they entered into this, um, into this world uh, perfectly uh, in unity with everything in the environment that God created, that everything in creation fit together perfectly, that there was no death, no disease, no sin, um, and that through sin comes the destruction and death and dying of this world. The central story of that is this human being, this, this human life of Adam and Eve being the caretakers and the stewards put centralized to the caretaking of all things in creation. This is an anthropocentric um, uh, centralized ethic. And so it does hold up humanity as being the supreme exception to everything else in creation. It does not acknowledge that humanity is dependent on the environment or creation. Um, and so there's some questions to this at times that other ethics might ask and say, well, humanity is, is in this position is dominant and supreme and exceptional, but 
in that position does humanity then take advantage and waste and destroy uh, and not sustainably live in the context of the greater environmental issues going on in the world. Uh, and so in our current world, there are other ethical perspectives that, that push back on this anthropocentric position and say, hey, um, you're not really taking into consideration the fact that um, human beings need things like the bees, we need clean water, we need air, we need everything in all of creation to be working in balance for the survival of humanity um, and enter into that conversation a little bit more deeply. So is this in your perspective, is it right or is it wrong to have an anthropocentric position? And I want you to consider this question I want you to make a note right now, if you're taking notes or if you're watching this, if you're not, grab a notebook, grab a piece of paper and write this, your answer to this question down. Do you believe that it is right or wrong to have an anthropocentric Western Christianized, Westernized Christian perspective on uh, the environment and environmental issues and managing our resources and things like that? Um, I am not going to tell you what is right or wrong. I want you to develop your own position and to identify your own ethic. And so I want you to start thinking about this question. So I am not going to play this video right now here. Uh, I want you to come back to the lesson and I want you to watch this video. We are going to watch this video with in-class students. This is a Bible project video on creation and it's going to walk through what creation is and why God created the heavens and the earth and kind of how it's all uh, together um, working together for the greater purpose of what God has for this world. So uh, you can stop this video and go and click on the link, or you can come back to it a little bit later and watch this video link. It is embedded in your PowerPoint. So what do you believe is the purpose of creation? How would you answer this question? Again, take a moment and ask yourself, what's the purpose of God creating the universe, everything in it, creating the complexity of all of the systems that work together in such infinite, finite um, complexity. Just think about how complex uh, it is that we have a DNA system the way we do in, in human beings. And then think about all of the millions of biodiversity of plants and animal species on the earth and the DNA that makes up all the different types of, of living things in all of creation. What's the purpose of that? Do you have an answer for that question? So again, I'm not going to take time in this video to watch these two, vi these two video links, but you can stop it and watch these two now. Uh, read in particular, what does it mean to be human? There's a link there again from the Bible project. And hopefully from some of those videos, you might begin to start to form an answer, at least according to what the Bible project is sharing with you. What's the perspective of the purpose? What's the purpose of humanity, the purpose of everything and all of creation? So take some time to explore a little bit more um, the video and the link there for you to read. then what is humanity's purpose and calling? I want you to be able to answer some of these questions for yourself. They are very objective questions. They do not require a yes or no black and white answer, but they are absolutely questions that you should consider if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, and if you do believe that humanity has a place in, in the environment and in creation to be a steward of it, to care, um, we should have answers to some of these questions. The greater common worldview of the secular world is constantly asking the Christian community, what is your position on this? Um, so what do you believe is your purpose or your calling? What is your reason for living? Why did God create you and put you on this earth? Do you have an answer to that question? And if you do, then a secondary follow-up is, is what's your role? So if you have this purpose and this calling, you're on this earth for a reason, what is then your role every day and every choice you make? Being a human being, living and existing in this creation that you are in, what 
is your purpose and your role? What does that look like? And how does that play out on a daily basis? So God created man in his own image. In the same image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, tend to it and keep it. These verses are sometimes read together to suggest that subdue and have dominion really mean tend and keep. It depends on the translation of the scripture that you're looking at. Having dominion is thereby made into this implied stewardship kind of relationship. And while we, we do not argue with the necessity for stewardship, the words subdue or to have dominion in the original Hebrew are strong words that are more in harmony with uh, onquest, with, with being part of a relational harmonized, tending and keeping mutual respect and mutual relationship with. And again, I want you to kind of ask yourself, are you in that anthropocentric position that you believe that we are to have dominion over, to, to um, control, to subdue, to have power over? Or are you in the camp where you believe that things have been given to humanity to be tending and keeping and being stewards to be in harmony with them. In what ways do we see that creation is not allowed to rest in the world today? When you read the scriptures and you see in Genesis, in chapter one, the creation story, from the de first development of everything in creation, even God took time to rest. So he created over a period of six days, and then he had this Sabbath or this day of rest. Right from the beginning of all of humanity, we have this example of how all things in creation need to go through cycles of rest, whether or not it's sleep cycles or seasons of hibernation, of regeneration, of seed sowing and dormancy and new birth and new life, everything in all creation needs rest. But what do you think is the current popular opinion and perspective on rest? In what ways do you see that creation is not allowed to rest in this world today? How would you answer this question? Do you feel like you are allowed to rest? Does the work world and business world, is it allowed to rest? This makes me think a lot about what happened with COVID-19. Um, when COVID-19 happened uh, over almost looking at 20 months ago, um, we out of nowhere went from a world that was very much in motion to a world that was shut down. And through those shutdowns, all of a sudden we saw this need for rest, this need that the world had for rest. Almost immediately, we looked at different areas of the world that were struggling with pollution and due to the decreased air traffic, the decreased cars on roads, the decreased need for people to be out in communities uh, and transportation needs around the world, almost immediately the environment responded to this cycle of quarantine or this rest cycle that we had entered into. Um, there are many stories that we can find if you look up on YouTube and you, you look up Google images about the environmental impacts of COVID-19 we saw that, that when everything got shut down, the world was able to kind of clean up a little bit. Waterways started to clean up. So for example, in Venice, Italy, uh, an area that was over, just overrun with tourism, constant traffic in the waterways of this water city, um, all of a sudden the waters became clearer. And there was wildlife that was returning to the different aqueducts and the different canals around the city of Venice and where dolphins and fish had not been in many, many years due to how much pollution and traffic those waterways had, the decreased traffic of transportation in that city caused their wildlife to return. 
And so there's videos and, and news reports of how Venice started to clean up its waters during the quarantines of COVID-19 in Italy. And we see cities like Shanghai, one of the most populated cities in the world that has one of the biggest air pollution problems within days, literally days of the shutdowns of that particular province in China, we saw the air clearing. You actually saw the smog start to go away. Within a month, Shanghai had clear blue skies. So that makes us really think about when it comes to the environmental impact of how busy we are and how we don't let the world rest. We don't let the world go through seasons of Sabbath um, we don't let forests burn like we would naturally see cycles of forests needing to burn to regenerate their seed growth. We would need to have rest cycles for rest of, of everything in all of creation needs to go through these cycles. So COVID-19 really showed us something about how we live in this world as humanity and whether or not we can or are able to slow down. That's one of the biggest arguments of climate change people out there is that we need to stop and to change. Uh, climate change uh, activists will tell global leaders, we need to stop the production of fossil fuels. We need to have these Sabbath and rest cycles uh, to allow things to regenerate. And the big corporations and governments of the world will say, will say, no, we can't afford to do that. It would cause economic shutdown and crisis. And so we, we, we can't shut down for 30 days. We can't even take one little rest. But the thing is, we learned from COVID-19 that actually it's not very long that we see the environmental benefits of some of that shutdown and rest. So this time period we've been in for the last almost two years has really shown us it might be possible. It might be possible to slow down and to have some seasons of rest and Sabbath. Sabbath is really, really important. God demonstrated to us how important Sabbath was. Our bodies need it, our minds need it, our spirits need it. Jeremiah illustrated the fa failures of humanity's dominion when he wrote, so this is in the book of Jeremiah, how long will the land mourn and the herbs of the field wither? The beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there. In the end, the yearly Sabbath in which land was to have rested and which Israel had failed to observe, were all kept at the same time during the 70 years in exile. He's reflecting on what happened uh, with the Israelite people. The, the Israelite people had not observed the Sabbath rest cycles that, that God had laid out and commanded them to follow. He gave them really strict rules about how to farm. He gave them really strict rules about taking Sabbath and making sure that your household, your family, that even your animals have cycles of rest. And it got to the place during Jeremiah's time that the Israelites were falling away from these commanded practices um, of the, the, the Israelites' uh, commandments and, and Levit Levitical laws and Leviticus were commanding them to do this because God knew what was going to be safe and healthy and bring them into community through those laws. And we saw that uh, the Israelites just, they turned away from that and they did not necessarily adopt those practices anymore. And so Jeremiah equates it to um, God turning away from God, that when we turn away from rest and we turn away from Sabbath, that it can actually have quite um, detrimental effects on us, it makes us unhealthy, not just physically, but spiritually and mentally. And when it comes to our earth and our creation, that we need to allow things to go through cycles of rest. Again, there are two, uh, an, a podcast um, with the transcript there for you, as well as um, a little bit more on the Sabbath that you can explore. So do you believe that there is more than physical existence? This is definitely a question for someone who does not have an identifying faith in Christ. Um, again, I, uh, all of the students that we acknowledged here this morning have all kind of nodded your head and said, yeah, I am a Christian. So um, then your answer to this question would be, yes, you do believe that there's more than our physical existence, that there is a spiritual side to who we are. Um, and as, a, as both a Christian, as well as an environmentalist like myself, I would say that we have a physical existence here in the world, and we have a spiritual existence as well, but that everything in creation also 
has a spiritual existence. And that because of that, God cares for us to, to be interacting with that nature, that there's a spiritual connection that we do have with the land and with everything in it. Um, there's many, many biblical passages that back this up uh, when it's referred to of, of how you know, the, the rocks and the earth, the trees, uh, everything will cry out and worship the Lord God. That, that when we care and we, we worry um, that God provides for the birds of the field, provides for everything in creation to grow, um, that he is not just providing for us as human beings, but that God cares for everything in this physical world. And that's because this physical world exists, but the spiritual world also exists simultaneously. And if you've ever wondered how you can explain this to someone, I absolutely love this video. This video is one of the best videos that I have that explains that overlapping relationship of heaven and earth and that relationship being something that we should care about, that what we do on this earth matters, not just for tomorrow, but for spiritually, for the greater kingdom of God and how we can have what uh, the Lord's prayer calls, you know, bringing the kingdom of God to, to earth, heaven to earth. Um, that it's important for us to put into perspective the fact that everything we do in our physical bodies on this earth does play into the greater spiritual connection that we have with everything in creation. So again, you can stop this video and click on this link in the notes and watch this video or wait and go back and watch it later. But this video is really, really a good one. So if you haven't done anything else yet uh, with watching the links or reading the articles, click on this video and definitely take time to watch this one. Here are two more examples of um, how scritch, scripture plays out into uh, the physical things in creation. So here is a connection to uh, a physical thing, water, and how even Jesus' teachings uses water in a spiritual context quite, quite a bit in his teachings and in his ministry, uh, and how there's so many analogies and so many metaphors uh, in scripture that use use nature as as a tool for us to understand um, and so water is one of them trees is another um, the tree of life the water of life um, they, they aren't just metaphors in my opinion yes they're used as teaching tools metaphorically for us to understand the kingdom of god and the nature of what god's doing through christ but there is a very fundamental connection of us of humanity and our role in humanity on this earth with the actual physical nature of water and trees and wildlife and, and everything in it. So again, here's two more links. Take a moment and watch the two video links that are here. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted, John 6, 12. This is from his sermon where there were between five to 10,000 people that were fed from the abundance of what he spiritually in that moment miraculously had duplicated to feed all those people. Jesus lived close to the land and he drew images for his parable, parables from creation. It's unthinkable that Christ who loved God so deeply did not also all love that God had made. Everything, everything in creation that God had made, Christ loved he loves humanity and he loves the bugs that crawl on the ground he loves the the molecules of the air that are part of our atmosphere christ loves the trees and the animals and the waters and the wind everything in all creation cries out for god and so this is just a concept that i want you to start thinking about um that's really kind of stands uh, against some of those more dominant theories of anthropomorphic or anthropocentric uh, thinking when it comes to um, being Christians who are dominating the earth. I don't think Christ would have taken that position. I think Christ was very much an environmentalist um, and loved all things in creation. Is caring for our, our world like caring for our bodies and as an act of worship the creator? I will answer that question for myself. You can decide how you want to answer that question. I would say yes. I believe that in the same way that we are asked to care for our bodies as temples of the living God, as a, a vessel for the Holy Spirit, 
that caring for creation is also really, really important because uh, we are to be in balance with everything in creation. We're to try to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Um, we're, tr we're to try to be good stewards and to restore things that have been damaged by sin in this world. Um, and that that's a mandate for us. Do you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not on your own. You know, we're commanded to care for ourselves, but the Holy Spirit is, is everywhere. It's in everything, you know, where two or more people are gathered together, the, there is the Spirit of God. Um, we know that God's Spirit is in us and around us and, and part of all of the things that God created in this world. So this really brings us to this question of, you know, we're in the world and we have to be in the world and we have to live and make choices in this world. But are you living of the world? Are you living as somebody who is just going along with what everyone else in the world is doing and just defaulting to that? What does it mean for a Christian to live on a daily basis to room environmental issues? Um, I think sadly, a lot of Christians dismiss environmental issues because of the mainstream scientific side of it and reject the mainstream science that they hear and think, well, we as Christians need to reject what's going on in the mainstream science world. I would push back on that and say, I think we should come at those issues from a Christian perspective, not to reject them because they may fall into a evolutionary conversation that maybe scientists going that evolutionary route talking about climate change being part of an evolution down spiral and some other things will we'll get our backs up and we and we think oh well christians shouldn't be involving themselves in these more scientific um aspects of 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 the world but i would i would push back and say no actually i think we could bring so much more to a world a world that looks at uh, so humanity that looks at the world through the eyes of Christ is a humanity I want to be a part of. When we see people through the eyes of Christ and when we see everything in all creation through the eyes of Christ, I think that we come that much closer to being humans on this earth and in this world that are not of the world, but are working for the kingdom of God to come to this earth. That's my perspective. So can you answer this question? How should a Christian live in this world? I do not want you to just adopt my perspective. I don't want that at all. I want you to adopt your own perspective. I want you to be able to make decisions for yourself and say, I believe this and this is why, because of this. And I would want you to really have that as a foundational belief system that you uh, could then work from to say, okay, and here's evidence of that. This is how I want to live out my life. I don't want you leaving this course, not knowing who you are as a person and your perspective, how you want to live your life on a daily basis. So that's the big question from today. How should a Christian live in this world? Uh, we're going to look at a couple other uh, ethics, environmental ethics, uh, uh, groups, and ways of thinking. Uh, maybe some of those might intrigue you, or, or maybe you might be like me, um, who, who uh, definitely adopts a different way of thinking than a lot of popular Christian streams might. Um, or maybe you do adopt a more anthropocentric position of Christian dominance um, uh, over the earth through um, what scripture has, has, has stated. Um, I just want you to be challenged to think about it, to think about your position, to think about how you would answer this question. Um, and what, is it, what does it mean to be someone who cares about the environment and also a Christian at the same time? Can they go together? And what would that look like? So that's it. Uh, you can go back and watch videos or look at articles in this lesson and take some time to make sure that you complete this lesson at some point. Um, on Friday's class, we will review and reflect and talk about this. Um, there is also going to be a Flipgrid response that I want you to make to this lesson today. So I will post this with this for Thursday's class uh, to watch this video, to watch and look at the other links and to make the Flipgrid response. And then we will see you guys on Friday. And uh, yeah, we'll pick up with a conversation there. So be thinking of how you would answer some of these questions.